Dear panelists, dear all, good afternoon. Uh, I would like to extend my warmest welcome to all participants of this virtual conference taking part in the framework of the French Spring Festival 2022. So this year, to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the festival, we decided to tackle the question of storytelling. So whose stories are we telling and who gets to share them? And as our invited artists and thinkers reflected on these aggregated individual tales through film screenings, workshops, concerts, and exhibitions, we felt the need to address a more global perspective of our contemporary understanding of history, which is why today we have the honor of hosting two esteemed guest speakers, Françoise Vergès and uh, Sujit Sivasundaram, to look at the Indian Ocean as an intersection of historical processes that have led to an evolution of perceptions, categorization, studies, and conceptual ge geographies, depending on the international, national, and local context. So Françoise Vergès is a political scientist, feminist uh, decolonial activist, originally from Réunion Island. She has published in French and English on feminism, France Fanon, et Césaire, coloniality, colonial slavery, decolonization of museums. And uh, her recent publications include uh, a decolonial feminism, a feminist theory of violence on colonial violence in the public space. Um, Sujit Sivasundaram is a professor of world history at the University of Cambridge and a fellow in history at Conville and Caius College. Uh, his most recent book is Waves Across the South, A New History of Revolution and Empire. It won the prestigious British Academy Book Prize given by the Britain's National Academy for Research in the Humanities and Social Science to a book that makes an outstanding contribution to global cultural understanding. Waves Across the South has significant material on the engagement between French and British explorers, colonists, travelers, and residents. It is also a reconsideration of what the age of revolutions, including the French Revolution, means for the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Professor Siva Sundaram has published widely on environmental history, cultural history, imperial history, the history of race, and the history of islands and the maritime societies in the global south. So whether drawing from the perspective of French overseas territories, such as Reunion Island, as will be presented by Françoise Vergès, or reconsidering world history as a sea of islands, as argued by Professor Sujit Sivasundaram, we believe crucial connections are to be made across the Oceanic South. Uh, analyzing power dynamics during and after colonization are of course at the center stage of this discussion, as we interrogate how societies have experienced the transfers in state power. So how can we develop to um, co collaborate to develop, write and communicate a shared history of colonialism across the Indian Ocean? Uh, do we need to rethink and imagine collaborative tools of knowledge production to access more symmetrical narratives? Um, these are a few of the questions that will be the entry points to our conversation today. Of course, addressing world history, even by focusing on one region of it is of course impossible to do over uh, an hour and a half, uh, but we hope that through a few case studies and milestones, we'll be able to have a, a few insights on how societies memorialize the past and how we can move forward with the historical, with this historical baggage, especially right now in these uh, turbulent times. Um, so we hope this converse, conference will lead to thought-provoking observations. Um, we'll first have a brief presentation by Françoise Vergès and then one by Sujit Sivasundaram. The floor will then be open to questions, so don't hesitate to write them uh, throughout the presentations in the chat box below. So thank you, and, uh, and I leave the floor to, to Françoise Vergès. Thank you. Well, thank you, Aurelia, for a very generous introduction, and I'm very, you know, honored to be in conversation with Professor Siva Sundaram. I mean, my work is not, you know, of the of the level of Professor Siva Sundaram. I approach the Indian Ocean as someone who lived there, but I mean, of course, for Professor also. But my point being that um, uh, what what I'm going to present is some answer to your question, Aurelia. Like, what do we do? How do we tell this story? You know, and some concrete experience. What I try, how to try to do. I mean, first, I grew up in a, a family of activists, anti-colonial activists. So the Indian Ocean was a place from which we thought the world. You know, and uh, through that, I mean, the, what was Indian Ocean? And at one point, my father was involved in a, in a project called Indian Ocean Zone of Peace. 
So the idea that the Indian Genocide should not be, you know, uh, like the Atlantic and the Pacific, a place of militarization and uh, uh, military base, which should become, you know, and which has it has become. I was also connected with the story of the Chagos Island, you know, the Chagos Island, which is in the middle of the ocean, and had become a U.S. military base land by the British to the US and the fight against, I mean, or the whole population was expelled and sent to Mauritius Island where they leave as, you know, refugee. And uh, we were, I was introduced also to that history. So the, the Indian Ocean was really for me a place of politics, of tension between, you know, power, a different power in the world, but also a cultural history. And uh, this is where I want to tell, you know, a concrete experience. Years ago, I mean, in 2000, uh, I became a member of a group of a team, uh, which uh, whose project was to propose uh, a proclamation for a museum that would be on Indian Island, on the ocean of Reunion Island, telling the story of, you know, how it was populated. And we uh, started by refusing a French colonial time which would have been, you know, when the French colonized the place and then we would have started, you know, like developing history, French Revolution, what is happening, you know, Napoleon, what is happening and so on and so forth. We say, no, our history, even though it's a French colony, of course, French time matter, but we belong to the Indian Ocean. And what is the Indian Ocean and in which effectively Europe is a periphery? And so we started by looking at, we were, I mean, the island is near Madagascar, so we were on the Africa-Asia axis, and so to look at that world, to look at that world and to refuse the temporality of a French colonization, so that was already, you know, how to tell story and not to start with colonial time. So we started with Indian Ocean time. I mean, the, the fact that this ocean was navigated by people for centuries before the European arrived. And starting from the story, so that was the space, the space was this Indian Ocean, and the time of different migration, that would be, you know, all the sailors, the pilgrims, the merchant, uh, the story of the Chinese, the Chinese present, of all this circulation. So that was, that was this we were started, because our argument was also to say that the people who were brought by the French on the island, whether they were from the east coast of, the, of Africa, of the African continent, or from Madagascar, or from India, or from Sri Lanka, or from China, came from places which had culture, social and political organization. They were not, you know, in waiting, you know, they were not without history. And so that was our history and the, the, the space and the time in which we, we will tell the narrative. So that was the first point, which of course upset a lot uh, the French state, for whom, for which it was very important to start with colonization and following, even in with a certain anti-colonial frame, you know, even blaming colonization, but remaining with that with that time, that temporality. So we refused that. The second thing about telling story about the Indian Ocean, very few uh, objects. Uh, remain, you know, very few things, you know, I mean, the enslaved did not bring so many objects and even the indenture worker coming from uh, all South Asia and East Asia did not bring that many things, you know, and all, and even if they, when they brought it, this object were not considered heritage, though they were not, you know, saved and, and uh, you know, uh, by, by the power. So what was left was the, the, the object of the colonial elite, I mean, of the slave owner and, you know, uh, plantation owners. So that was also what, how do we tell this story of this? How do you, what I call writing on water, on the water of the ocean, what would be, you know, the page of history, which would be the waves. I mean, to borrow from the, the, the title of Professor Sarazanova. So it was, you know, like this question of, I mean, coming from, of course, the, the, the theory of uh, ocean as cultural space to look at that. And uh, to, to start also again to your question uh, about narrative and what will be to, to build a museum without object, where the object will not be the, the um, from what the story, the narrative is being, is being told, you know, because if you don't have object, it's as if you don't have any story. And so, but if you don't have objects, you still have a narrative and a story. So how do we will do without this object? Uh, I mean, the object being, being mostly language, uh, you know, uh, rituals, uh, food, recipes, uh, uh, songs, music, but not really material object. So that was also a question we raised in which we thought that the Indian Ocean will be also very present through that. And uh, on, the other things also about how do we tell this story was to um, bring all the language we had been spoken once 
on the island, rather than the French English, you know, uh, things or even using Creole. It will be also Urdu, it will be, you know, Hindi, will have been Cantonese, Swahili, Malagashi, Shimaore, you know, Comoro Island. So it was also the, the question of language as as uh, as an element of narrative, of telling a story that, that matter. And uh, so the, it was not to illustrate, this language would not have been to illustrate, to say, oh, well, they were the language, but to tell from the, uh, the way they, they tell the story, the, the story. And one also we will be using, it was what now Sadia Man had called nonfiction fiction. It was like to work with fragment and uh, pieces. Uh, so for instance, we were telling, how do we retrace, uh, let's say even the story of a young woman uh, from uh, Tamil Nadu who is taken in 18, uh, for 45 or whatever, and is brought uh, to Reno. Uh, so we will not, I mean, no, there was no uh, history, really no narrative, but we can say she came from that place. What was that place at that moment? We can, you know, find information on which boat she was taken. You know, most of the boat were sailor ship, which has been, you know, uh, recommended for, for indenture uh, uh, trip. She arrived in Réunion, there was a barrack where, you know, quarantine, and then she went to that plantation. What was the plantation? So through that, we could tell a history. And also we will tell the story of uh, pilgrims, merchants that travels throughout Indian Ocean, that whenever that, that the hegemony British and French and even Portuguese hegemony never stop. And also uh, to look at the Indian Ocean as a circulation also of ideas, uh, revolutionary ideas, um, uh, you know, ideas of anti-colonial idea, ideas of decolonization, and how this circulated. Because I do remember that even in Reno, because I so came from a family of activists, but even in Mauritius, you found a lot of journal coming from all the Indian Ocean realm of anti-colonial organization. So that circulation, which did not, of course, was not uh, that the state could not control, uh, brought by sellers, for instance, in sheep and things like that, you know, so all this old narrative, you know, that belonged to the circulation in the sea of the Indian Ocean and escaped, uh, you know, quite a, you know, without romanticizing it, but escaped uh, the, the colonial hegemony. So that was how to answer uh, to this, uh, to that question of how to tell this story of a small island uh, which is French and a remain French uh, department, but which belong in fact to that uh, space, space and time. And, uh, uh, and how this, you know, what is called the processes of creolization, but we can find out the name, occurred on the island and, and produced something different. That was fought, uh, uh, you know, that the state fought against very strongly and now try to recuperate in the discourse of, you know, uh, diversity and inclusivity, but remain in fact a colonial presence. So also the Indian Ocean as this history of colonization and decolonization and against today of struggle against militarization, against, you know, all schools, as we know, it's a very important ocean in terms of in geopolitical term because of the oil, the presence of the oil. It's also the presence of the Muslim presence, which has been uh, treated as enemy of civilization. Uh, the, the, also the arrival of China and India as power in this in this ocean. So for me, uh, an incredible, uh, rich uh, possibility, rich source of thought and, uh, and thinking for not only the history of the past, uh, the history that will escape perhaps uh, the hegemonic Atlantic paradigm, although you know there were connection between the Indian Ocean and the, uh, and the Atlantic much more than we think, but also for how it matter for today or thinking today you know, uh, for thinking about uh, the world today, uh, and of course uh, the Indian Ocean and different things. I mean, the, if you look at the Indian Ocean, you can think about refugee, the question of refugee, the question of migration, the question of militarization, the climate, climate disaster, uh, the question still of, of circulation uh, of ideas, not only of people, but also of ideas. So very, for me, um, the, the, the how to tell this story is not uh, it's not so much a question of that there will should be new methods. It's for me you know, listening to this voice that have been you know not li been listened to, and which are there you know for instance the 
for us was to find in Creole uh, the presence of Hindi, the presence of Shi, uh, Swahili, the presence of Shimore, and of course of French. But that was also, you know, the, the sickness of uh, that language, which is not considered, uh, uh, you know, as a language by the French state. But the, that sickness is also a narrative. So, you know, it's it's more. Uh, rather than finding new ways or new writing, it was to listen differently and to look differently at and to listen with, you know, uh, with a lot of attention uh, to this, uh, uh, to in fact, this history which are there and being, are being uh, told. Um, and a very rich uh, history. Uh, for, for us, of course, in Réunion Island, the, the importance of Madagascar, uh, which is often forgotten. Uh, which is a huge island, <laughs> it's, it's not a small one, and, and a very interesting history. So it's also, um, it's not so much, you know, challenging, it's like listening to something else, you know, looking at something else that's going to tell you a uh, different uh, narrative and history. And of course, uh, the, my last word would be, you know, it's a very also rich in literature, and literature, you know, and, and poetry, are also incredible source for historian and for telling uh, stories, you know. Okay, I think I have covered my 15 minutes. I don't want to take more. Thank you very much, uh, Francoise Vergès. It's really interesting to, to look at these forgotten stories that sometimes we need to be looking at more carefully. I'll go straight to, uh, to Professor uh, Sujit. The floor is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. And hopefully you can hear me as well. The internet seems to be playing up a little bit, but hopefully it's not going to play up too much. Um, so first, many thanks to the French Embassy in Sri Lanka for uh, the kind invitation and Aurelia especially for hosting this event. Um, and I should say also a, a big thank you to Francoise. That was really wonderful and actually sets me up really, really well for what I wanted to say. Um, there are a lot of things um, that we have in common, I think, um, that we're using different methods. I think one of the things is uh, that came out of that talk, which I will totally endorse, is the ocean as method, if I can call it that. Um, and um, that's very, very important uh, to my work as well, um, because what does it mean to be talking about the ocean as method? Well, it's often the case that we think about the ocean as a place which is not lived in that people live only in big continents and big states like you know, India and China, certainly I should mention, given the crisis in Sri Lanka right now. Um, but really to think about the ocean as a place of habitation where people have moved over centuries and where things have happened, that history has happened, which is really important. I think this perspective is vital, especially for island societies in the Indian Ocean, including Sri Lanka and including Madagascar and the Mascarene Islands, including Southeast Asia. Um, so really the ocean as a place of habitation uh, but also the ocean as a place of meaning, I think, came out of that talk. And that too is something that I adopt in my own work. Uh, meaning that, you know, people reflecting on the ocean, um, seaborne voyages have been really central to history. And in those voyages, laboring communities, um, uh, migrants of various kinds, revolutionaries of various kinds have had to rethink themselves, their place in the world, their politics. And so actually the kind of the movement uh, across the ocean has been really generative for new ideas uh, in history. Um, and I would say the ocean is a place of speaking, you know, where people can talk across the ocean, literature can move across the ocean, creolization language came out very strongly in that talk. And so this is a multilingual space, the Indian Ocean. It's not a space of elite languages like, say, in the early modern period, Sanskrit and Persian. Uh, it's actually a kind of space of vernacular languages of very many kinds, uh, and that's important uh, to keep in mind. And finally, the oceans method. Certainly, the Indian Ocean. I would argue, starting to write a new book. I don't know how long it'll take. Even though the last one took about ten years, but um, the book is going to be on the centrality of the Indian Ocean. Um, it's going to be called the Ocean. At the moment, the title of the book is Ocean: at The Center of the World, um, because I kind of completely agree that the Indian Ocean, because of fossil fuels and the climate crisis, because of low-lying cities, because of the origins of global trade in the Indian Ocean. Uh, is really a key site to watch for the human future uh, as well as the human past. So that's Oceanus Method. But another thing that I wanted to highlight from that talk, which kind of ties across to my own work, is also the fragment really as a method uh, which came out, I think, uh, in that talk, uh, and really the centrality of biographies of non-elite people uh, who are moving. And this is something that has been very important for Waves Across the South, the book that was kindly mentioned earlier, where what I tried to do was to actually 
um, in a sense, populate, uh, I kind of say populate because the, the category of the age of revolutions, which is central to that book, has been dominated by the French Revolution, I'm sorry to say, in this context, by the American Revolution, by the Industrial Revolution. And so what I wanted to do was to kind of say, no, 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 we can actually populate it with indigenous peoples in the Oceanic South. And so for that reason, what I tried to do was to sort of use fragments of um, material culture, of objects, of texts, to try and recover indigenous politics in the late 18th and the early 19th century. And so that was really the agenda of Waves Across the South, uh, the book. Um, to really kind of overturn, if you like, the established view of the age of revolutions via these big events, but also via the Atlantic. I mean, it's not to kind of say the Atlantic is not significant because of course we have the revolt of enslaved peoples in the Caribbean, we have the Haitian revolution, we have Latin American independence movements, with, which give rise to huge numbers of new states in Latin America in the early 19th century. This is the period we're talking about. It starts with the French Revolution and goes to the Latin American independence movement. It's not to say that those events are not significant. It's just to say that for whatever, for very significant reasons of imperialism in historical writing and racism, we've forgotten the story in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. We've sort of imagined that it's only an Atlantic story. And so what I wanted to do in Waves Across the South was to use the fragmentary archive um, in order to recover these revolutionary indigenous peoples and their politics to bring them back in. And that meant not working with canonical texts, but working with fragments. And it also meant working with islands. So the island here is also a fragment, I would argue, because as uh, Aurelia quite rightly said, it is an argument for the Sea of Islands. The Sea of Islands is a concept that comes from Pacific theorist Epelia Haufer. And the idea here is that, you know, we can have a whole sea full of islands, little, little kind of places, but are not little, which together actually create a whole world unto its own. Um, and so just on that point, um, I spent a lot of time uh, doing research in Mauritius, of course, uh, and also have material in Madagascar in the book. And what was amazing to think about was the relationship between Sri Lanka and Mauritius uh, in this period uh, in relation to rebel biographies. So um, since we're speaking here in Sri Lanka, but all kind of bizarrely online. Um, we've got to remember this. I mean, there is the story of the Mascarene Islands, the Southwest Indian Ocean is related to the story of Sri Lanka. Um, and one of the reasons it's actually very good to have this discussion in this context is because in Sri Lanka, we think about the Portuguese empire, we think about the Dutch empire, and we think about the British empire. So in schools, you'd have classes, you know, the, the Dutch period, the British period, the Portuguese period, but we don't think about the French, right? Because, you know, the French were, didn't formally colonized Sri Lanka, etc. But what I would argue is that really the tussle between the French and the British is really, really significant for the whole of the Indian Ocean. And that it is, there is a story that needs to be told for Sri Lanka as well, um, that we can think about. Um, because one could argue that um, the British take Mauritius at the same time as um, they're consolidating their hold on Sri Lanka. And it's in the context of the Napoleonic Wars. And it's because of the fear of the French uh, that the British are advancing on these island societies in this period. In the meantime, you have all kinds of people moving between Mauritius, uh, the French Indian Ocean world and the South Asian world um, through French territories in India. Um, and one of the stories I actually tell in Waves Across the South um, is the story of Tipu Sultan of Mysore, who is of course well known as uh, the rebel kind of uh, one of the rebels who went to war with the British in the late 18th century. And one of the ways he's remembered is because of his correspondence with the French. Um, and um, various historians quite rightly in some ways cast him, though there are some problems around this interpretation as a Republican, because there's a Republican club in Mysore in South India and so forth. But there's actually an embassy which Tipu Sultan of Mysore sends to Mauritius to ask for help. And so what you're getting there is, you know, the whole South Asian world of rebellion and resistance to the onslaught of British colonialism actually kind of meeting the world of French speaking, kind of the Southwest Indian Ocean world. Uh, and one could take that to Sri Lanka and say that in the midst of rebellion, of course, the great rebellion after the fall of the Kingdom of Kandy, the rebels are of course sent to Mauritius, right? Um, and so there are all of these ways in which the histories of the Southwest Indian Ocean world, since you've been thinking about that right now, need to be linked to the history of South Asia. Um, and if we are to understand the rise of the British Empire, because of course the British Empire did rise, we need to do so in the context of the French sort of presence and in the context of the Dutch presence uh, and so forth. And so it's a much more complicated story. No one gets an exit card is you know, one way of thinking about this, right? Because we can say, you know, that the, the 
in some histories, we can say the British were doing this and the French were doing that. You know, the French were assimilating, the British were segregating, et cetera, et cetera. I think these dichotomies are not very helpful after a while. We need to actually get beyond them and to think really about the complicated logics through which these different imperial projects are interrelated. And then in turn, how people below who are rebels and so forth, in turn occupy these spaces um, for their own purposes, crossing kind of imperial realms and crossing sites uh, across the oceanic south. So that's just actually now I've said, I, I didn't write that, <laughs> I didn't expect to say that, that's just a response to the previous talk. Um, and so in the few minutes now that remain, I will not use my slides, but I will kind of, <laughs> you know, um, do something else. I will just give a quick summary then really um, of waves across the south. So as it's probably evident already, um, it is an account of the age of revolutions. Um, but what I'm doing is I'm taking this concept and kind of really turning, trying to turn it around um, by placing these indigenous peoples, um, not only in the Indian Ocean, but also in the Pacific who figure here um, into uh, this category of the age of revolutions, but also making it their own and saying that there are all sorts of revolutionary projects that were going on in this era uh, that are forgotten. But sadly, they then meet the counter-revolution of empire and the counter-revolution of empire in the project is the supposed promise of liberty, right? So in a sense, you know, we will take these places over because we alone can give liberty to these people. Um, so effectively the language of the French Revolution, the language of the age of revolutions is then imperialized. And as it's imperialized, all of these sort of prior indigenous projects of meaning of, of politics are actually sort of, you know, taken within it. They don't disappear because of course you can never kind of totally suppress indigenous politics, but what you get is actually then that sort of imperialism actually sort of adopting and subverting the very language of uh, the French Revolution in these spaces. Now, if I were to just think about Mauritius for a minute, of course, this is sort of tied up with the whole language of emancipation, right? So, you know, you get, um, on the one hand, the British liberate supposedly, you know, in, in propagandist terms, liberating Mauritius from the French, but actually slavery carries on uh, under the British, right? Um, uh, Robert Farquhar um, is supposedly is abolitionist, but actually kind of there's all sorts of, you know, enslavement going on in that early period of British rule. So in fact, the kind of typology of the British against the French does not work because there are all kinds of crossovers. And then the whole language of, um, emancipation is actually utilized for the agenda of French-speaking elites uh, to sort of, you know, support their own causes uh, to the exclusion of people of color in Mauritius. And then into 1848, which is, you know, the big moment of revolution right across Europe, there are kind of events happening in Mauritius, but they in turn are also very kind of racially segregated where certain kinds of people can join these meetings and associations and not other kinds of people. So what I'm saying really is that there's a sort of way in which this sort of revolutionary moment, yes, is subverted, is sort of taken up by elites, is kind of created into an imperial one. Um, but beneath that, uh, there are all these sorts of stories of indigenous peoples uh, that need to, to be recovered. And in order to do that, we need to kind of cross Britain, British imperial history, on which there's, there's a whole industry of books on the British Empire, with the French Indian Ocean. And we need to sort of center uh, the islands. And we also need to realize that actually the kind of whole idea of history is born in this moment as well, because history sort of begins like the history of, in the English language, the history of Sri Lanka, the history of um, Mauritius, the history of South Africa starts to be written by colonial administrators in the 1830s and 40s for the first time in order to, you know, create a history which is, you know, this forward march of progress and rationality, which, you know, pushes everything which is of indigenous peoples to one side. And one of the, th one of the things that I was really shocked by in, re in writing waves across the South is to track in places like Mauritius, but also uh, in places like Tasmania, there is you know, um, extreme racism in the sense that in, in Australia, there's a collection of indigenous remains. Um, in Mauritius, there's a lot of kind of commentary on indigenous bodies and even, you know, people, you know, these historians watching people being executed and so forth. So it's really horrific detail here. But the point being that actually the origins of history emerge out of that propagandist project of imperial propaganda. And so we need to unwork it now in all of these ways. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor, <laughs> for, for this very interesting insights. Um, there's a lot of material that we can uh, that we can kind of work on for the rest of the discussion. Um, I don't know if first there is any questions from the audience, but the first one that I would like to ask is um, a question of method. So um, you were discussing the ocean as method, and I was just wondering when we we're speaking about forgotten histories, did you find any limits in the in the research and how to approach it um, as a historian? And how how can you can you tell these stories? And yeah, what was the method for the for your book and also for, for your own research if you if you can share a bit on this? <laughs> Go ahead, Francis. <laughs> Me first, yeah. Well, uh, you know, the, the point, for instance, as I say, uh, um, you know, the, 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 the presence of people have been erased by colonial uh, state, right? By colonial French states. So we cannot rely even, you know, like going to the archive and, you know, the uh, reading again the brain is something, of course, but nonetheless, it's, we have also to uh, find other way of telling the story. Really, you know, like not just the archive or, you know, counter reading of the archive. Uh, it was, as I say, you know, listening to songs, leaning, listening to poetry, uh, letters. Um, uh, and there is an in also the, the indigenous language of the ocean, uh, what is being said, uh, you know, differently. Um, and so the limits, um, it's also to work with these limits because colonial history want to be uh, totally um, full, you know, like it, it will tell everything. It will tell everything about the indigenous people. It will tell everything about everything. And so this is part also of the colonial uh, project. It's always hegemonic, right? Explaining nature, plants, animal, everything, right? It, uh, it would be like a, a a totalitarian uh, story. And I do think that keeping the story not, you know, effectively you know, like, uh, like defending a story with, with uh, limits, with holes, with, uh, with you know, uh, it, it's, it's part of the, in fact, another uh, uh, writing and listening to the history of what is called anonymous people, the ordinary people. And being aware of uh, things that are not part necessarily of the uh, history, historical narrative usually, uh, the way they conceive birth, the way they conceive death, the way they conceive, you know, what it was else, uh, you know, the, the relation with is for me part of also the, this other uh, form of story, especially in the Indian Ocean, where you had, at one point, for instance, I did also a research on the South West Island, Comoro, Seychelles, uh, Madagascar, uh, Réunion, Mauritius, and, and the circulation of uh, mig migration through this island, which escape also sometimes the colonial history. It was not people just being transported by British or French uh, imperialism, but also people who circulated and, and came. And so that's also to listen to that, not to also uh, taken um, with the narrative of colonization as, as hegemonic, as total, and that will tell the, uh, the history. Um, so for instance, why, why did, um, um, you know, why some people from Gujarat went to Mauritius or to Madagascar and established themselves? What was this history outside of the way, you know, the French uh, colonial history will say? Um, so for me, it's really what is called from below. And I don't, uh, I'm not, uh, what can I say? I'm not uh, stopped by limits or, you know, the fact against, you know, what also, um, uh, what was said, you know, about the fact you work with fragments, you work with absence. You know, for instance, uh, the, the, for the French, uh, there is no history because there is absence of object, absence of what for them, you know, Versailles or whatever, the, you know, wish to tell the story. And that absence is part of the colonial uh, discourse. You are lacking this, you are lacking civilization, you are lacking technology, you, are, you do not have Mozart and Kant and whatever. And so that language of absence and lack is that define also for mobilization. And for, and for us, it was like, no, not to, to take absence as lack. It's not because something is absent that you are lacking something, you know, it's just, it's absence. And recognizing the absence is, was, will, be, will have been part of our methodology. 
Yeah, no, thank you. That's that's a really good question. I mean, I think um, in terms of method, I mean, certainly I'm a historian, so I, I do kind of follow a historical method. Um, and I, you know, um, uh, so I, I, I the, the book is based on archival work, but not just, so I suppose the way I kind of thought about this is that the archival work um, is not kind of a, not official archival work in the sense that it's sort of much more you know, um, from below. Um, so certainly uh, I, I, in the book, what I tried to do was I prioritized archives in the global south um, over archives uh, in Europe. But I also prioritized less official documents um, of various kinds, um, diaries and so forth. Um, and then I kind of really tried to prioritize visual images and uh, objects uh, on the basis that in each of those moves from the kind of official archive to the less official archive, from the, the north to the south to objects, that, you know, basically at one end there's a lot of silencing, and at the other end it's more possible to hear voices. Um, but of course there are still silences. It's not like, you know, objects reveal everything or images reveal everything. So one just needs to kind of be very, very critical of I mean, certainly you can read against the grain and so on, but I think you, what, the way I kind of think about it is that you've got to kind of contextualize very different sources um, and non-textual sources uh, in order to do this kind of work. And it's definitely the case. You need to speak to people today and you need to share with people today on, you know, in various sites, because I don't believe that you just kind of, you know, you're not a historian who just goes to the archive and find something. You, in a sense, the questions that I asked were very directed by, a whole series of intellectuals um, who I met and who I'm still in touch with and so forth. So, um, you know, it generates kind of relationships and, you know, I'm you know, asked to examine vivas or whatever. And where should, I mean, it, it just kind of generates this sort of exchange, which is really, really wonderful. So I think it's part of a conversation. The method is a conversation um, between intellectuals and between researchers uh, from very different places. Um, I think it's important, actually, uh, methodologically, and especially if one is, you know, writing on Sri Lanka and writing on, to um, not simply center the nation state, the modern nation state. Um, and so one of the reasons I kind of wrote Waves Across the South is because of the need for solidarity across island states. And I think this is one of the questions that we have in the chat. So um, I think methodologically, yes, it's a conversation with intellectuals and researchers in various places, and that directs you into the archive and into the visual sources and whatever. But it's also then really driven by a kind of politics of the present and the need for a politics of the present um, too. On the question of the encyclopedia, um, I, yeah, this is something I'm really, really keen to emphasize that, you know, world history, which is the field that um, I'm placed within, should not be an encyclopedic history. It should not be a total history, um, and that that itself is a sort of imperial act. And to go back to the point that I was making earlier about these history texts, which were first written in English, in you know the, the first English language history texts, and maybe even the French language history texts uh, of the nineteenth century for the, the states in the Indian Ocean, um, they tried to be encyclopedic. Now, if you look at them, it's incredible. They're hugely statistical, kind of you know, like you know how many people, how many fields, how many houses, you know, it's it's sort of like a kind of encyclopedia of fact. Um, and the idea is that because you amass all of this data, then you can colonize more, you can improve more, you can, you know, change the economy around in these ways and so forth. And that's not really what we need, need from historical narration. Um, we need to be kind of really aware of the dangers of, you know, writing a history of everything. Um, and so, yeah, so it's not, you know, I don't think there should be a history of the whole of the Indian Ocean from start to finish covering everything. Um, I don't think that's what we need, because if we do do that, we lose the specific, we lose the perspective of this individual and that individual. So I think what we need is to start from below and from, from the ground, uh, rather than from you know outer space looking down on the Indian Ocean. Um, yeah. Well, just to add, you know, one one book that uh, when we were doing this project that uh, uh, before effectively uh, the, the other books on the edition was Pierre Larson, Ocean of Letters, uh, you know, on the yeah. and after. which really challenged a lot of things about also the formation of language and translation in the Indian Ocean and challenged the idea that people were losing their language when they arrived because of slavery or indentorship. Uh, because it's it's about uh, uh, enslaved Malagashi in uh, Mauritius uh, continuing to uh, in fact uh, have letters with uh, 
Madagascar with uh, their uh, family. And it's a uh, fantastic, but for us, it was also very uh, important in, uh, and you know, uh, with our intuition that we do not have to uh, rely only on what the French have taught uh, or the British uh, or the Portuguese um, and the American today. Uh, but, uh, you know, so that was, uh, that was a very, yeah, that's, that's so a you really know that, uh, that book, of course. Yeah, I do, of course. Unfortunately, it's very sadly he passed away, right? So that yeah, I know. Is very, I know. We mentioned it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. An interesting point from um, from waves across the south also was the question of cartography and the you, you, the use of maps. And uh, is, was this a surprise in terms of source of archive that in the end there is not that much this uh, European monopoly over over mapping and how, how it's the process of using maps or indigenous, indigenous Yeah, I mean, in some ways that's a, that's a good question given our discussion because the, the, the point is that indigenous peoples were navigating across the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean already. And so this is one of the you know, standard myths of European science and knowledge that the Europeans drew the maps, you know. There were no maps before and suddenly the Europeans came and they drew all the maps. That's not true, you know, that's totally not true. Um, and um, so, yeah, the cover of the book, um, the kind of the first cover of the book was actually um, modeled on a, on a Pacific chart, you know, that the Pacific Islanders used these complicated um, charts made out of coconut fiber, made out of shells, made out of various kinds of uh, natural materials to navigate, to show where the current was, to show where the islands were and so on, right? and you can see these online. Um, and so that was there on the cover of the book. But I mean, I think um, more broadly, thinking about Sri Lanka, I've written about this in, in Sri Lanka as well. You know, in Sri Lanka, there are these wonderful texts called the Viti Pot, Pot and the, the Kadayam Pot, um, which are boundary texts, as uh, you can translate them. Um, and, you know, in a sense, they're kind of riddles, um, oral riddles uh, that were told across the early modern centuries in order to find your way from X to Y. Um, and I would say that this, it's a kind of cartographic kind of text. Um, and when the Portuguese arrive, you know, um, they're quite interested in this. So I think, you know, there are ways in which boundaries are drawn and which limits are set and which in which navigation across the sea is conducted. Of course, one needs to only think about Arab cosmography and navigation as another context for this. Um, and uh, this is very important to keep in mind because it demonstrates that, you know, science doesn't arrive from one place, Europe, to this part of the world. Um, and similarly, there, is, there are modes of habitation and I, I don't want to say ownership, but actually, you know, this is not an empty space. You don't just arrive and take over the land or take over the sea. Um, you know, that's the traditional European kind of argument that the sea is empty and so it's owned by the Europeans. So the land is, you know, not possessed and so it can be taken over. This is not the case because there are these maps and that there are ways in which people know their place of residence and their kind of ocean. I mean, it was also, effectively for us, it was a question of, for instance, the, we wanted to open the museum for, uh, from current image and then enter with the Al Idrisi map of the world, you know, in the one century, and then use a lot of map in which, and also Arab map in which, on which the island appear. But then it's as if, you know, when we go to school, it's just the, you know, the European map and suddenly we are given birth. So we were challenging also this idea of get, being given birth by colonization, you know, that uh, there was something before. And also uh, uh, it, the idea that, you know, the sea has not been that important, um, has been neglected a little in anti-colonial uh, uh, discourse and practice, you know, and the sea brought uh, first, I mean, effectively uh, exchange and circulation uh, prior to the arrival of the European in the Indian Ocean, but also the sea was also the one who brought the slave ship, you know, the, 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 the ship that colonized with a cannon and everything, you know, and today the Indian Ocean being, you know, one of the most important uh, ocean for uh, commercial uh, trade, maritime trade. So it was also to reintegrate uh, the ocean as a place very important in the story, you know, of, of the world and not just as an appendix. 
they were that, and there was also this idea that you know is in uh, is a Malagashi philosophy, but it's also appear or elsewhere, you know, in some uh, African also understanding that the sea uh, they, there is no uh, separation between land and sea. There is a continuous space, you know, and all the bodies of water are connected, the river are connected with the lake, which are connected with the ocean, we are connected, but also, you know, for Malagashi uh, philosophy, there is no, like, this separation that Europeans have between land and sea, and therefore their, their idea of the sea that has been to be, you know, mastered and, and conquered and, and, and civilized, which is not the same thing. So it was also uh, for 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 me, it was also to think differently, and that uh, this understanding is, I think, very important today uh, with the issue of uh, you know uh, climate disaster and everything you know happening. So yes, the the the, the water not in the conception because maritime history and the historian will uh, agree or will will tell us more uh, is I mean in European story is a story of men, it's a military story of sheep and captain and, you know, like all these things and treasure island and everything like that, which is absolutely never things from, you know, from below, from uh, from other uh, uh, part of ship. So for instance, for us, it was also to show all the ship that have been traveling in the Indian Ocean. So the dough, the other thing, you know, not this, just the colonial ship of, you know, uh, arriving in uh, India or in China. So effectively, there, there is also reappropriating the sea and the ocean as a, as a pro producing meaning, also in producing, I don't know, the, a, a culture that is, uh, that is not just um, the conquering uh, space uh, through which imperialism can effectively arrive someplace and impose uh, their power. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for both of these insights. Um, and, and yes, and drawing upon on this um, on this question of the ocean as at the center stage, um, what would be the link you would uh, you would put with the religion also aspect that you mention quite often, and the, the the links that would be drawn between, for instance, the Burma and Sri Lanka, if I'm not mistaken, and the links that would be drawn with the Buddhism. Um, would you say that there is some interconnections between the ocean as well and uh, and religion, or it's kind of separate movements, or are there, you know, any ties? <laughs> um, yeah, I suppose the Buddhism question is for me. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's it's complicated, isn't it? I mean, so I mean, I don't think I no, there wasn't a chapter on religion. Actually, first people have asked me this question about why there's no chapter on religion in this book. But anyway, um, that's I have to think about that a bit more. But um, but you're right. I mean, the, I mean, in Sri Lanka, the kind of story of Theravada Buddhism, um, what happens is that these monks from the Kingdom of Kandy um, and from the interior have these links with Southeast Asia. Um, and the story is that when you get a higher ordination, um, you know, you need a certain number of monks and then the number of monks declines. And so they have to bring these monks from across the Bay of Bengal. Um, and so there are these links, but there are also kind of various political links then that follow um, between uh, Southeast Asia and Sri Lanka as a result of this story. Um, so how does the ocean come into that? Well, of course, the monks have to go over water and there are ships and there are various texts about these embassies and so forth that you can look at. Um, but I guess the kind of point that I was making is that even for a kingdom such as the Kingdom of Kandy, um, normally you can think about the Kingdom of Kandy, but this is a colonial narrative. This is a colonial narrative as, you know, in the highlands of Sri Lanka, totally, you know, isolated no access to the sea, you know, on the coast, there is the, the, the Dutch, and then finally the British, and then finally the Kingdom of Kandy Falls, of course, as we mentioned earlier, and, you know, the rebels, there's a link to Mauritius in, 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 in that moment. But what I'm saying is, is that the Kingdom of Kandy actually has oceanic links, um, certainly for Buddhism, but also for trade, um, for instance, um, you know, it, various points has had a historic right to, to five ports along the coast. Um, and so we shouldn't think, and this actually maybe picks up the point that Francois has just been saying about land and sea, you know, it doesn't see itself as a landlocked kingdom. You know, it is a kingdom which has access to the sea and the sea is there. And, you know, if you look at, you know, 
the palm leaf texts um, from Candy, they're full, like all the kind of texts about the king, they're full of metaphors about the ocean, uh, which is really interesting. You know, the Candy Lake is the ocean of milk and so forth, right? Uh, or it's it's like an ocean in the in, in the interior of of the kingdom, and, and you know, this is project to build it. So I think you know water is there, and the ocean is there, uh, even metaphorically and imaginatively, in as much as you know you're sending monks, or you know you have these trade links with faraway places. So so maybe that's the point. Um, not only simply about religion, but actually about how even the most interiorized kingdom, the kingdom which supposedly is landlocked because of all the hills and you know all the stories about how Europeans get lost and so forth, you know, because the kingdom is guarding knowledge to itself by the hills, that even such a kingdom, you know, has a sense of the ocean and the ocean is significant to it, uh, is, is maybe the way to think about it. This also absolutely contemporary issue it's very important to think, I mean, what Indian Ocean also, this long history tell us also about a lot of understanding what's happening today. I mean, if we want to understand what's happening today, we have to also to know that history and have some singular really, really, of, a, of effectively uh, the importance of the Indian Ocean for the empire. I mean, the, the tendency to look at the Atlantic, the history of Atlantic and the Caribbean, which were extremely important of course, the Asian revolution and something like that. And if we look also at the way of decolonization and colonial struggle in the Indian Ocean and the connection that existed through the, between islands, uh, the importance of the you know, anti-apartheid struggle for a lot of you know, movement in the Indian Ocean. And we are not exactly the same narrative. And so it's important. And who were the intellectuals effectively, you know, and uh, who were there? And uh, so we don't know just the name of the, you know, C.L.R. James and all, I mean, very important people, of course, you know, Du Bois and very important, but nonetheless, who are, and Cromer and so on, but who are those on the other side, if I may say, you know? And who matter? And what were the journals that circulated? What were the review? What was their, you know, uh, what was the intellectual story uh, of that uh, of that ocean? Uh, and it's not just uh, so. I don't want you know like to make it as an exclusive, like a specific, but nonetheless there is something uh, to retrieve from that, and uh, especially for today, especially for today. We have uh, one question also from the audience. Um, it's uh, addressed to you, Françoise Vergès. I, um, I read, I note the African Union Agenda 2063 makes reference to the independence of Reunion Island. What do you think of this? Also, what claim does Mauritius have to the Chagos Islands, given Mauritius only gained independence in 1968? Geographically, would the Maldives have a better claim, or would you prefer that Chagosians are repatriated from the Mauritius? and that they would gain independence. Well, I mean, to, to start with the Chagosian, this is what the Chagosian want, want to return home, but that would never, unfortunately, that would mean, you know, uh, fighting against US imperialism. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it's one of the most important US maritime base in the world. It's very important for the US. It's extremely important. It's, Absolutely essential. Is equidistant, you know, like to strike in Africa or in the Middle East or even to Afghanistan. So it's absolutely essential, you know. Don't forget this is a root of oil. You know, the Indian Ocean is the root of oil. And you know, we know today even more so with the, the, story, the invasion of Ukraine, the importance of oil in you know what happening. And at the same time, the story I mean the oil in the question of climate disaster. So the, the, what the Shagoshan are raising is not just the right to return, it's like this history also of militarization of the Indian Ocean, the history of the you know, military base, and the increasing militarization, increasing also extraction of the ocean, you know, looking through, I mean, the canal of Mozambique, the French being there, looking for oil, looking for this, looking for that. I mean, how the sea has become also the, the next, another next is already happening, like site of extraction. You know, with all the kind of damage it's going to mean, you know, the fact that, you know, a lot of fishermen community are being like pushed away, whether it's the East Coast 
of Africa, Mauritius. I mean, that's certainly you did see that you, you saw it when you went to Mauritius, Professor Sivasun uh, Dam. I mean, the, the fish, I mean, the, that it's just resort after resort after resort after resort. But this is effectively, there is something in the ocean that was, uh, was precluded or uh, allowed us to foresee what, you know, what's going to happen, you know, like uh, what's happening, you know, with capitalist extraction extractivism. So when we look at this story, we have to look also at, at this, you know, what, what's happening in terms of, of this, uh, of this struggle. Reno, oh my God, Reno, the French, you know, I mean, we have to look at it, you know, when the French finally, you know, lost Algeria, as I say, I mean, they, it was, we will not lose any other thing. It's very important, don't forget that France has island in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific, New Caledonia and the Pacific Island, where they have the nuclear test, in the Caribbean, Martinique and Guadeloupe, and in South America with Guyana. It allowed France to be the second maritime power in the world. I mean, this little country with like two little coasts is a second maritime power. It gave it a lot of interest in terms of research, biological research, oceanic research, volcanology, you know, I mean, with Guyana, the Amazon. It's, we, we cannot underestimate. It's not just the remnant of the colonial empire and the colonial nostalgia. as really very important for us. It's a military presence, it's a cultural presence. It allows France to sit on any regional organization. So it sits in the Indian Ocean Organization, in the Pacific Organization, in the Caribbean and South America. What, you know, who other European state can do that? And it's part today of very important, the Indo-Pacific program of, you know, like, uh, which is also an important a program that we should be aware of because it's a reorganization of, you know, I mean, you are saying that now the importance is Pacific and so on. And the people of the region, you know, that the people will be effectively the, those who will pay for all this, you know, who will uh, bear the cost of this uh, imperial uh, reorganization with new actors of India and China and Russia and so on, but nonetheless, um, it's still a site of imperialism, of different imperialism. So Réunion will, will, you know, uh, there was a movement, independence movement in the 60s, 70s, which was very strongly repressed. Um, censorship, uh, prison, uh, assassination attempt, and so on. And um, the, the French state is a remain a colonial state. I mean, there was a Republican coloniality to, to, to you know, that notion of coloniality. And uh, so there is something also perhaps to, uh, to rethink of what is Indian Ocean in terms of also what would, you know, in terms of politics, in terms of alliance, because Réunion itself, you know, will never be or more So what would be, it existed, it existed a lot. It may also uh, start again, you know, um, that effectively what is uh, the common interest of people living uh, in, you know, uh, of, the of the Indian Ocean realm. And they are interests, they are cultural, political, economic, uh, you know, linguistic, uh, and there is a possibility to, to propose something different than what is being, you know, actually uh, being done. So Réunion cannot be thought outside of this, you know, uh, and uh, as it was in the 60s, 70s, when it was very connected with what happening in Mozambique, in Madagascar, in Mauritius, in South Africa, and in India, there was a lot of connection. But the construction, I mean, what uh, also what um, what was, you know, Sujit was saying of the nation state, the re renationalization of, of politics as Katistari, you know, Afghanistan, that you certainly you have, and especially what we see, uh, what's happening in India right now, you know, of, of a certain idea of what is to be Indian. And this has consequence because in Réunion, the Indian diaspora has been targeted by the PGP to become Indian, to belong to Mother India. You know, so there is all this that we have to pay attention when we have this question to look at this, all the different element, local, regional, and global, that effectively contribute to, uh, and, and there is a common interest of the people, the indigenous people of the Indian Ocean, to find again, you know, a, a, a common, I will not say common voice, but a common horizon uh, of, a, otherwise it's a militarized, it's going to be more and more militarized. Um, there is, you know, again, remember, this is 80% of the oil, uh, a lot also of the, of the even trade from China goes through and then the Suez Canal. So it's a very, it's effectively uh, at the art of things. And if you read the, you know, the 
the Pentagon or uh, the Defense Ministry uh, uh, program of French and so on, you see the attention they have for this uh, for this ocean. So Réunion will be in that. And for the Réunionist people, if they want to uh, separate themselves from French coloniality, they will have to think, you know, in terms also of the region and not just of themselves. So, so Francoise, would you say that the Réunion Island is subject to two parallel histories, a way two shared histories, the French and the Indian Ocean? Or how, how can you um, combine? Well, certainly, I, we cannot think, you know, as this is what we say, you know, when we wanted to do this museum, that France, of course, were there. Well, we, are, we were in French colony and a French department, so we're not going to ignore France. Uh, but it's not the only, uh, it's not the, 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 the only referent. They are not the only source. That's not possible. We live in the Indian Ocean. The Indian Ocean is our space and our temporality. It's not something which is 9,000 kilometers away, right? We are not Normandy or Limousin. We are really in New Island. And so we are, uh, but that connection, as I say, that existed has been very much cut by, you know, nationalization of politics and something has to be uh, retrieved, you know. And uh, we cannot think of the future uh, even of Réunion or Mauritius or whatever, without uh, this uh, uh, of rethinking uh, what the Indian Ocean was also what, uh, you know, uh, Professor Savantoran was saying, that what, what, what this history tell us, what is the source of, what can we learn for today? Not just, you know, as an historical interest that is always effectively good, but what what effectively can we retrieve from this indigenous history that you know what is in you know the, the topic of well across the ocean? What can we retrieve that is a source for today? You know, not just it's the same as yesterday, it's never, but nonetheless, it's a source of inspiration. We have effectively to decolonize, uh, you know, our uh, the space. I mean, the speciality in which we live. And you believe there are collaborative uh, tools of knowledge production that we can imagine? And, and if so, what would it be? How can we move forward now with this um, perspective to, to, to build a more symmetrical? Um... I think the production of uh, knowledge, you know, that what the, the book that, uh, you know, uh, that, are, that are published, that is telling, that is producing like a, a new library, if, if I may use that word, you know, uh, that's something. And also uh, for us, scholars and activists and artists that effectively reorganizing network of exchange. And, uh, and that one is, for instance, what, what you have organized is, is an example of that. But uh, yeah, talk to each other again, you know, like effectively not refusing uh, nationalization of knowledge. Uh, refusing ethnicization of knowledge, you know, and, and effectively say, no, that's, that's, we have it. The history of the state and nation state is one, but there is, the Indian Ocean is not a national history and neither an imperial history only. It's also the history, as you know, to use the term of the indigenous people, you know, and they have something, they, they have an understanding of, uh, of their history and of the world that is uh, extremely useful for today. That's what I say, but I'm sure that Professor Sivagandura must can add something. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I agree with that um, totally. Um, and th th I think there's a question for me in, in the, should, should I take that question? Or, yeah, okay. So, so this is also from Rashan De Silva, um, but he is asking, um, on contextualizing current geopolitics in the Indian Ocean. Um, how do you env envisage Indian Ocean nations coming together and insulating ourselves right now from external shocks as we face fuel, energy, fertilizer, wheat, and bread? Yeah, I mean, the first thing to say is, I mean, I, um, yeah, I mean, I sense sort of my real sort of thoughts and solidarity to all of you really, because I'm not in Sri Lanka at the moment, and I know it's actually really, really difficult. Uh, in Sri Lanka um, at the moment, um, so um, I yeah, it's it's a it's a really um, dangerous and difficult situation, especially for um, certain individuals. So I uh, yeah, so that's the first thing to say. Um, 
Um, the second thing to say is as a historian, of course, I mean, I, I, um, I'm not going to be able to solve the immediate issues because that's not my, my role here. But what I can say is that there need to be some long term solutions as well, even as we try to solve the immediate issues of need in relation to fuel and food and so forth, that we need some long term solutions. And I would suggest that one very important long term solution to the current crisis is that we educate ourselves on the nature of imperialism. Right. That clearly has been a gap of understanding uh, in Sri Lanka about the nature of imperialism, meaning that Sri Lanka is an island state in the middle of the Indian Ocean. It has been multiply colonized by the Portuguese, the Dutch, and here I mentioned earlier, maybe we need to think about the French in this story as well, uh, but maybe not formally, uh, the British. And now we have you know, a whole series of outside big powers trying to get hold of you know, bits of Sri Lanka. And also you know, the financial situation uh, is very much really conditioned by these relations between the island state and superpowers of various kinds who might help us, who might not help us, um, who might intervene. And I think this is a really, really terrible state to be in, actually, um, a really unacceptable state to be in. And it shows a lack of understanding of uh, the history of Sri Lanka as a site which has been multiply colonized. If so, what is required in Sri Lanka is educational tools, public awareness, so that we aren't, once again, I don't know, in 10 years time, 20 years time, because it's going to be a long time, isn't it? Um, in a similar situation where we are a, a dependency uh, in these ways. Uh, and to do that, uh, we need to read more history. Um, certainly, we need to be critical of um, narrow nationalism, we need to be critical of imperialism, and we need to kind of develop, I would argue, forms of solidarity with other smaller states as well. Um, I mean, I'm not suggesting that this will necessarily solve the current issues, I'm suggesting this is a long term strategy. Um, and here I think the kind of notion of the Sea of Islands, the idea that you know there are a lot of small states which actually experience similar kind of issues and have resisted and responded to similar issues uh, can be really helpful. So I think we need to sort of, in a sense, not simply just look to big superpowers uh, to solve the problems or empires, shall we say even, uh, but rather to actually kind of develop a mode of political action and activism, which actually kind of operates in a different plane. And that's something that can't happen overnight. It is a very long term thing that needs to be developed, right? So yeah, so that's that's as much as I can say, really. Um, and maybe uh, given that the question is also about fuel and energy, I think thinking actually more sustainably as well, uh, which is something that a lot of Sri Lankans are already very good at, um, but we still need to develop much, much more um, given you know projects afoot uh, on the island, which are not sustainable. Um, I think we need a much more sort of, you know, um, clear idea of what it means to live in a biodiverse island in a sustainable fashion. And uh, another connected question um, from Dishani Senaratne. Uh, how would you envision, so for both of you, how would you envision, envision the future of the Indian Ocean as a new political and security region? Oh gosh! <laughs> hopefully, hopefully not. Hopefully not a political and security region is what I might say. Um, oh, I mean, as I say, ideally, what it should be is a place where people live and you know inhabit and uh, make meaning, um, rather than a space that's taken over by outside powers. And so, the whole point of the talk was actually to kind of push in that direction. Um, but clearly it is the case that it is, you know, um, a zone of contest between India and China and um, various other superpowers as well. So, um, yeah, it is worrying. It is worrying because I suppose that aspect is juxtaposed on the aspect that this is a very fragile ecosystem, which, you know, cities can be, you know, under threat. Uh, the monsoon is changing in the Indian Ocean. And of course, as we know, um, one very important dynamic in the Indian Ocean's history is the monsoon, you know, in terms of all the migration and so forth. And so if the monsoon is changing and, you know, you can look at what's going on with the weather in India at the moment um, to kind of actually worry um, what is the future. So I suppose what I'm saying is 
I'm not the right person to answer the question of what the security future of the Indian Ocean is, but what I'm saying is that we need to be kind of critical of, we need to actually have another narrative, which is a narrative of inhabitation and, live, you know, connection and so on, um, if the Indian Ocean is to sort of carry on um, really as a space like it has been. Well, um, I will say, you know, that um, to, to think about the future, to imagine something, uh, we have to educate ourselves, you know, we have to educate ourselves with where, where is our place. We cannot really answer, you know, so she was saying that we have to have, a, you know, we appropriate, appropriate our own narrative. We can, you know, really, really not having, you know, Europe in our shoulder constantly, you know, saying that and that. We have to free ourselves, really of something which has nonetheless, you know, for a century uh, occupied uh, the play, the, the cultural space and the educational space. So we say really education, education, education is very important. It's very important to effectively denaturalize colonization, denaturalize extraction, denaturalize hyperconsumption, which is totally killing us. So like, uh, you know, if it, um, how can I say, a feed a, a, a spirit of curiosity and, you know, like uh, asking constantly why, why is like that? And so, because there are other possibility. And so no, there is no other future. Yes, there are other future. There are, they may be difficult to attain, but there are, you know, alternative. There are always been alternative. You know, uh, for me, was been uh, working a lot on slavery. I mean, slavery lasted four centuries, colonial slavery. But there was not one day in one part of the world where, you know, enslaved, we're not fighting. We're saying, you know, like one day we will be free. You know, that freedom was, was a possibility. It was not, oh no, well, you're mad, freedom, you will never be free, no. So that is a very important a form of utopian thinking, but a good sense of the term, you know, like not less build whatever things, but that there is an alternative to that. The second thing is I would say also to, to rebuild uh, the, the, the root of solidarity and connection this has been really a notion of realization, which means that effectively within the friction produced by imperialism, people met and, and talked to each other and, and invented new languages, Swahili or Creole or the different Creole or whatever. Um, that what people will, you know, that there was a free market, but in, not in the capitalist sense of the, of, the, of the term. And so, yeah, so we have to uh, re, uh, reconnect uh, uh, the, uh, the Indian Ocean, the indigenous people, um, and invent, reinvent ourselves. I mean, this future would be invented by ourselves, by the people, the indigenous people around the Indian Ocean, by no one, no one else. Um, and certainly exchanging experience, okay, this, you know, Bangladesh would be, you know, like this city would be, you know, disappear under the sea. And how, what is the connection with, for instance, you know, a coast, a coastline in Kenya also disappearing because, you know, this and that. Uh, so, you know, uh, um, all, all this, you know, what's happening in Sudan, how do uh, we re reconnect ourselves to each other? And that would be also a denaturalization. And effectively, uh, working against nationalization and ethnicization of narrative, that's very important. So perhaps it's some form of Indian Ocean identities on uh, will be important. That will be therefore not, you know, this, um, I'm from Mozambique, I don't care what's happening in Sri Lanka, their business, or I'm in Sri Lanka, what happened in Madagascar, their business. No, how do we rebuild something that is common, uh, you know, not uh, without any romanticism, but with the reality of living together in that ocean that brought so much to us and have given so much um, and and can you know and how also we um, perhaps thinking you know how do we enter a uh, political reparation toward this ocean uh, that has been so mistreated and which has been such a source of uh, of, uh, of uh, yeah enriching uh, humanity. I mean the people living around the rim, you know. Uh, uh, the extraordinary, I mean, what, what historians describe of the cities around the exchange is an extraordinary uh, story, is, a, is, is a really a story of um, the possibility of, you know, I don't know, Indian merchant arriving in Lamu or, you know, in, in Kilwa and with a Chinese and Armenian, whatever, and then, you know, that there would be um, a possibility of, of, uh, of sitting 
together and, and finding way of, of, of trading. And so, because it's not to be against trade, it's to be against a certain form of trade. Another question quite broad that we have from the audience is uh, to both of you, what was the most re rewarding thing about your research and what did you learn? <laughs> quite broad. Well, uh, um, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I don't have an answer, but um, it, it's, it's one of those questions which is very hard to answer because you know there are so many things along the way and you forget things and you remember things um, and so forth. Um, what was the most rewarding thing? Well, you know, I usually answer this question or questions like this uh, in relation to the book um, by, by pointing to just stories that, you know, were really surprising, um, which, and one of the stories which I've, um, which I found very powerful was the story of Aboriginal women uh, in Tasmania. Um, and um, the, the story goes like this. Um, see, this is the north coast of Tasmania in what is known in Europe as the Age of Revolutions. Um, and of course, in Tasmania, there's a genocide, um, a horrific genocide, um, which leads to the depopulation of Aboriginal peoples. Um, but in, beneath that and before that runs the story of the sealing complex, where, where people are sealing on the coast of Tasmania. And here the gender order is actually quite different. The Aboriginal women are the, are the people doing the sealing and various men um, form communities around them, um, which, uh, you know, are, 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 so, so in a sense, the men rely on the women. Uh, the, the men here could be American, they could be uh, French, they could be Portuguese, they, you know, they could be escaped convicts um, from Sydney. Um, and so I, I suppose it was stories like that recovering uh, not not recovering, but you know, listening to and uh, telling these stories of a very different gender order, and actually thinking through uh, indigeneity and the kind of different ways in which indigeneity was formulated, really, uh, in uh, these water-facing islands, uh, which were then, you know, changed um, by by settlement colonialism as well. So I suppose what I'm saying is that yeah, there were just really surprising ways of being, um, you know, um, ways of being which are very unfamiliar to us and very unfamiliar to not just modern politics, but also modern gender norms uh, in relation to, of course, you know, um, the usual story, which is that the, the ship is a very masculinized space and you get all these naval explorers in all their uniforms and so on, which are European coming through. So very quickly, you know, that earlier gender order transitions into, or is, is you know, has to meet this European imperial naval order. Um, but really, I mean, yeah, so that kind of thing more broadly, not just in Tasmania, but elsewhere. It's, it's a very horrific and violent story, certainly in Tasmania. Um, but just reflecting on past lives, I guess. Um, I mean, this is a personal kind of answer rather than um, one about the structures and, you know, actually being interested in, in lives in the past and, and what they mean for us today um, can be very moving. Well, yes, I agree with that. It's very moving to find, you know, history. I remember finding the story of Malagasy woman and, you know, ending up in Australia, the, you know, writing back. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary, you know, like that. Um, what I will say that well, um, brought to me it like, a, um, like a, when you, learning about the Indian Ocean, that um, the conviction that they are, um, uh, a way of telling a story differently. I mean, and, and also it's an endless source of knowledge. It's, it's really feed your curiosity. It's really, so you're endlessly curious and that's a gift, you know, because it's never had, there is never, you know, handing. Uh, it opened the door to something else and you think about something else. It's, so it's, it's absolutely uh, uh, exciting uh, it, it's really exciting. It's not at all uh, boring, and uh, and since I don't like to be bored, it's uh, it's a very it's uh, very good. No, it's it's absolutely uh, there is a beauty in the story. There is a beauty of the, of uh, taking the ocean as uh, effectively as a space. Uh, um, and to listen to it, even you know, uh, when you grow up in an island, you know you 
the ocean is there and this is not something far away it's just there it bring uh, it bring hurricane it bring uh, you know uh, it bring winds it bring you know so many things and so it's there it's a presence it's not a passive um it's belong to the world and and so you have to it has to be with you I mean, it's not just it's not an object that's what i mean and so don't treat it as an object treat it also as a and uh, as I say, for me, what has brought to me is a, uh, yeah, is a um, endless curiosity. It's fantastic. I mean, this incredible exchange that has been going on for me, you know, for century, for century. And the the role of the island uh, is, as I say, it's an endless source of uh, of knowledge and and also challenging assumption. You're constantly, oh, I thought it would no, you know. You learn something yet. And if it is a question of gender also, but the fact that, for instance, a lot of indenture women, you know, who left, it was not just because they were caught, of course, some were caught and kidnapped, but also it was to escape for some of them. I have the, the um, uh, you know, uh, grand, 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 grandmother of a friend of mine uh, who came from uh, Tamil Nadu, and she did not come just because she was caught. She came to escape family, to escape also patriarchy patriarchal and gender role and hoping that there, you know, that in a place she did not know, she had like no clue what was on your island. But you know, like this kind of like jumping, you know, like a like hope of, a, I think is, is quite, and that we still see today uh, with people wanting to, to, you know, to escape something and find, and that has been seen by the, the West as a threat, as a, you know, migrant. And on, in fact, it, it, this are a, a story of incredible courage incredible courage you know incredible uh, and incredible hope and i think hope is a very important uh, um, thing i mean uh, in uh, in imagining uh, a different future thank you and and one last question i had uh, before closing this session it was the role uh, to ask about the role of the diaspora because of course it has been crucial throughout history in the, across the Indian Ocean, but how can the diaspora today also be part of this shared history? And, um, and yes, how, how to integrate the role of the diaspora in, in it, in this process? Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really, really good question. Um, well, I suppose that, you know, Sri Lankans and Indian Ocean people more broadly have always been diasporic. Um, you know, we, we sort of think of the Sri Lankan diaspora today in a certain way as, you know, um, partly because, of course, there was uh, a lot of people who left the country in the middle of the war and, and so on. And so maybe numerically there have been changes, but it is still important to remember that, you know, Sri Lankans have been diasporic for, for a long, 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 long time. Um, the immediate thing that comes to mind is partly because we're, we're speaking about the Southwest Indian Ocean is certainly the story of indentured labor, you know, and, um, you know, that all of these documents in South Africa, for instance, which have Sri Lankan linkages and so on. Um, so I, I think that um, it's not the case that diaspora only originated in the 1980s for Sri Lanka or the 1970s to 1960s, you know, it's a very, very long story. Um, of Sri Lankans being on the move um, for various reasons. Um, the Sri Lankans have been restless people, always you know, moving from here to there, I would suggest. Um, so yes, so how do we integrate um, the role of the diaspora today? Um, I think um, the, the interesting thing that comes out of migration studies and diaspora studies is that often this mobility generates, you know, formations of new ideas, you know, how you get kind of anti-colonialism or even the notion of India, you know, developed in diaspora, for instance. So one could, you know, actually say that we, and this may be another kind of answer to Rishan's question about, you know, the problems of today, that the diaspora here shouldn't just be, you know, um, remitting money or, or, or something like this. The diaspora can be a space of political debate and we should actually kind of think about island societies in diasporic senses as sort of, you know, um, spaces of political debate and, and so on a, a bit more. Now, the traditional way of thinking about the Sri Lankan diaspora is that it's very divided along ethnic lines um, and it's, it's very nationalist in certain ways and so forth. But maybe actually we're at a moment where, you know, the diaspora itself is changing. I mean, I have the sense from Sri Lankan students in the diaspora who I teach and so forth. Um, and maybe it is time to actually rethink 
the possibilities of the Sri Lankan diaspora and what it can do uh, in the present moment, um, I would suggest. So, um, so I suppose what I'm saying is the diaspora provides a vantage point in, which is different. Um, it can be a site of creativity, um, but it's not something um, that we should see as, um, I mean, we should kind of historicize the diaspora as well um, in, in, in engaging with it. I mean, I mean literature, Sri Lankan literature is a really good instance, actually, of um, the creative significance of the diaspora. Um, you know, reading recent books um, written by diasporic individuals, uh, Anup, uh, Arup Pagasam's recent book, which is on the book her shortlist, is, is you know, a really good instance, really, of the role of diaspora, where he talks a lot about moving between um, Sri Lanka and India, which mirrors, I think, though I don't know his biography well, his own life. So I think, you know, there's a way in which in literature in Sri Lanka, it's very evident that diaspora is playing a creative role. If so, it should do so more broadly. I definitely agree, you know, a need to historicize diaspora and also to look, you know, at within the diaspora, the class difference, the gender, all this question that also is not the diaspora, but diaspora as plural, even coming from the same place, right? And also, uh, I mean, years ago, I, I got a grant to study a Chinese restaurant in, in the East Coast of Africa. So to enter the question of Chinese diaspora through the restaurant, because that's a niche, you know, for a lot of uh, Chinese uh, migrants. And so to look from the beginning of the Chinese, you know, diaspora and going through, um, you know, what is today Maputo and was Lorenzo Marquez from Macau, and so the first wave and then the second and, second and the current one. And I had, do you see gender changing at the beginning? It's most particularly only men. And then the recently women also, Chinese women, uh, the kind of restaurant, how the, re the, the restaurant become a place, you know, and the Chinese food. Through that, it was also a point of entry. So the question of diaspora, which was not just, you know, like, a, you know, and looking at um, the food, the, you know, is the Chinese food in Durban, Maputo, Dar es Salaam, the same, or are they different? Or are they different from one wave to another wave of migration? Are they different because suddenly you finally have gin ginger that you did not have before? And, you know, and so on and so forth. And even the question of the decor of the restaurant, you know, is a Chinese restaurant always a Chinese restaurant with an aquarium and fish and things like that, you know? So it was like to look at these things like and tell the story of diaspora differently than, uh, you know, just uh, from a sociological point of view only. And also the aesthetic of life uh, also, you know, through that. Um, so they, I, I would say, and today, I mean, diaspora is changing constantly, constantly. You have many, many more Comorian in Reno Island that you had before. So it's also changed Islam on the island, which because most of the Muslim arrive from Gujarat and now say they come from the Comoro Island, but also, so you do have a constant, I mean, the, the transform also, not only uh, the, the, by their number, but they also change, uh, you know, they affect the social and, and cultural organization of the place. What work are they doing? You know, what kind of thing? For instance, Muslim were a lot into trade in Réunion, you know, of textile and clothes because they were, you know, at the beginning. And now they are into, uh, you know, housing. And you know, so it's also interesting to see the, di the different uh, level and how some uh, become more wealthy. And uh, so they treat, for instance, the, the, the oldest, uh, Muslim uh, migration treat the the more recent one differently because they are not the same thing and they're Comorian, so they are blacker. So you have to look at all these uh, dynamics and the gender dynamics, the question, but it say a lot. The, the, the fact being, as you know, Sujit was saying, that people have been circulating forever in this ocean, absolutely forever, absolutely. Forever. But what they produce, a different point is also different because of the context, because of, you know, the, uh, is a country independent, not independent, still a colony, not a colony, is still, you know, within uh, the nationalization of politics. I mean, all this uh, create uh, uh, different things, but, but the diaspora and the Indian Ocean has been, you know, so uh, old that effectively is a different person image than the diaspora uh, from the Atlantic, which are so much um, affected uh, by the by the slave trade, of course, the massive slave trade, uh, which is not uh, the case in the Indian Ocean. So effectively, it's uh, people circulated. You know, I mean, they circulated for they have been circulated for centuries. 
And uh, so, yeah, it, it's different. Uh, I mean, the Malagashi uh, is a migration. The population, the Malagashi population is a migration from the beginning, you know, coming from Taiwan or whatever. So it's really a notion of, uh, of exchange, uh, really. And so as the ocean as method will be also um, that the wave, let's say, has been constantly moving, bringing uh, people, but also species, you know, grain, whatever. We know that the wind brought, uh, you know, like trees suddenly is arriving in Mauritius and they were not brought by human necessarily. So this sort this, I will say, um, it make an approach to diaspora and through diaspora, we also have to look at the settler colonialism um, and those who stay and become, you know, and so how do you account for that? What has happened, you know, what South Africa, for instance, you know, it's a, and they are not considered diaspora, they are considered, you know, settler, uh, uh, settlers, but how this has changed I mean, for Réunion, I mean, of course, this is a specific case, but the presence of French people have, and the growing presence from since the 2000s have deeply transformed the society, deeply, deeply transformed. They are more than 10 person, and so they are very important in terms of, of affecting politics, cultures, uh, economy. Uh, so I think have to look at all this, but it's very important. The question of diaspora are very, very important in the region. It's a vast question that it will be, it's difficult to answer in just like in a short time, but it's a historic, yeah, need to historicize, to look at gender, to look at class, uh, and to look at the, the, the politics of the state uh, at that moment, whether it's a colonial state or the post-colonial state. Thank you, thank you so much for all these insights. We'll slowly move towards our conclusion to uh, to stay uh, on time. <laughs> um, so thank you to Françoise Vergès and Sujit Sivasundaram, our two speakers, for accepting to be with uh, with us today, and um, and to everyone also who took the time amidst power cuts <laughs> to take part in this session and amidst difficulties and to to continue reflecting uh, also. Um, and I will personally leave this conversation with a lot of, a lot of thinking points <laughs> to, to reflect on. And uh, we hope to continue this conversation also on shared history through new formats uh, of discussion, of reflection, of activism in a way. Um, and I wish you all a very pleasant rest of the week. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.